Rory, how are you doing over there? In the I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Okay. Very interested today to see what we're going to do. Um, I think you're going to like it. Um, cool thing about this is that at the end of the day, we're going to have another cool feature to add to the uh, collection that I think people will want to use and download. So let's 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 talk about it. Um, sure. You're you're probably uh, at this point if you're listening in, you're probably already familiar with Coders. One of the features in Coders is uh, tap to next reference. We're going to just hit the tab key and cycle through all the references within uh, a particular um, uh, solution. <coughs> it even works on types, like for example, I can go through all the bools, for example, in, within a particular solution. If you've seen some of the other web webinars that Roy and I have done, um, you probably recognize some of this code. This is this object initializer test solution that we created the first time we were testing out object initializer just to test out and you know, work with the um, plugin. And ever since then, we've been just reusing it for everything that we've been doing. So um, here's the code we had for object initializer. Here's the code we had for the uh, our assignment intended um, uh, code issue and corresponding fix. Um, and um, and I've added a new piece to it called, with this class called single digit multiplier. And the reason I have <clears throat> is because I want to extend tab to next reference. Um, tab to next reference works on types and type references and in, uh, in other files like uh, um, XAML and ASP.NET has some other uses as well. At least the tab key there has other uses that are very similar to tab to next reference. <coughs> and in fact, this all started, the, the extensibility in the area of tab to next reference was all started, I think, from Rory, who was essentially <laughs> saying, hey, when I'm working with uh, 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 ASP.NET, and I'm, you know, I've got like a, an HTML file, and I've got like, you know, like a, a bunch of list items, and I'm in the property of one of those. I'm, I'm in one of the attributes of one of those list items, like say, oh, yes. the, the width or the color or whatever, something like that. I want to hit. Roy suggests I, I want to hit the tab key to just get to the next corresponding element of the next list item in there. So I can just very quickly change all the properties of one particular type and just tap through those. Am I right, Rory? You made that suggestion. Yeah, I, I, I remember certainly. I, I thought I'd actually seen it as a feature. Very often, the the you know so the the, the boundary between reality and, and what is actually there is, is sometimes hard to remember. Um, but yeah, it was a kind of uh, several sibling uh, HTML elements that would all have the same property or the same attribute. I thought it'd be nice to right. sort of type one in, hit tab, and then hit the next one. Right. So, so Rory saw uh, one of the features we had, which was uh, like tab to next table cell item or or a variant of that. And he assumed that the feature was everywhere. And this is like a great, great starting point for a new feature, right? You see something that's easy, and then you go to another, another area, and you, you want it to be just as easy. Well, that is what's happening with tab to next reference. Um, in, uh, in prepping for this, I, I actually prepped for this, like, what, yesterday, I think, last night? Or, you know, I, I went, you know me, Rory. I, my, my preparation is not, you know, extensive. What I end up doing is I end up, you know, checking to see what we're even talking about like the night before, which is what I did. And I was thinking about this and I thought, you know what I really want with regard to extending tab next reference? I want to have the caret on a magic number, like here in this case I had this single digit multiply class, I have a magic number called 10, and it essentially indicates the upper limit of what this single digit multiplier will be able to handle. So it can multiply digits 0 through 9, but not 10 or, or above. And so you see the number 10 showing up several times. What I want to do is hit this tab key here, um, and uh, uh, let's say, uh, go ahead and know on that right there. Hit the tab key and actually have it do something. That was from some prep. Let me, that message you just saw was from some prep that I had done earlier. Let me kill that prep stuff that I had done here. Oh, I wonder. <clears throat> so it's not showing up here, so I think if I just change this. And then go back and click OK on that. I think that will that'll hopefully uh, clear that out. So I was going to say there was extra context, but I just realized context was removed because I deleted the plugin as I was working, so we should be OK. So at any rate, what I want to do is I want to put the caret on a, <clears throat> a magic number, hit the tab key, and then go to every other magic number within the same file uh, that matches that same value. <clears throat> That's Let's nice. bring up. So that would allow you to, to find out where all those tens were before maybe then replacing them with a constant? Exactly, so which sometimes you want to do. Sort of the da potential damage you'll likely cause or, or how far-reaching it will be. Exactly, because sometimes you're in a large file and it's not your code, and you see a magic number, like whatever, you know, like, like 255, 
and you're thinking, okay, that seems kind of unique, but let's verify that it's used, it's used in the context I'm expecting it to be used everywhere through the file. And so you'll just hit the tab key. That's the idea. So you'll hit the tab key through the magic, all the times you see them, through, through that magic number, all the occurrences of the magic number. And then at that point, you can decide what you want to do if you want to replace them all or not, um, or, or, or get, turn it into something more meaningful. The other thing that's very cool about that is that sometimes you might have a magic number that really doesn't have an explanation except for in one place in the file. And so you can tab, you can start at a place that's where that explanation doesn't exist, tab through it, all of a sudden get to the comment that says, here's what the deal is with 10, and then you can say, ah, okay, got it. So it's kind of a, it's a tool for understanding code is what this is going to do. Yeah. I brought up the expressions lab over here. I wanted to show you this. So I'm on the number 10 right here in the code. Over here on this side, I have, uh, it says that it's a primitive expression. And uh, that's the element type, primitive expression. And, and the, there's two things that we want to look at. One is the primitive type here. Here it says it's int32. And here's what the dropdown looks like. So we have all these different predefined primitive types that this can be. So if we're going to find another primitive, we know that its primitive type must also be int32. And then the other property that's of interest to us is the name property, which says that its value is 10. I just want to check to see if it, I was actually expecting to see a property called value, but it's not. So we're just reusing the name property. We use that frequently because every language element has a name. So that name is often going to hold some, some key descriptive information. So that's what we're looking for. All right. So let's show how to do that. So we're going to go into DevExpress, say create a new plugin. I'm going to call this, uh, I had a great name last time. What was it, the Dispose-O-Matic? Yeah. For the uh, plugin we wrote last time, Roy? That was it. Um, I don't think I'm going to come up with a great name for this one. I have nothing in mind yet, but we're going to call this um, uh, maybe Primitive Tab. Primitive Tab, like that. <clears throat> so to create that, Now let's bring up the uh, toolbox. One of the things you're going to have to do is, by default, this you're going to need a control that's not on here by default. So you need to right-click this, to click on Choose Items, and we're going to look for something called a searcher provider. And and you know, every once in a while, Rory, when we're in here, we we run across, we come across things that where we think, you know, what we should rename this. And this is one of those controls that we're going to safe rename. So when we say okay. safe rename, what's going to happen is we'll give you, we'll get it, uh, we'll create something else that's more visible, and put it on the um, <coughs> there it is right there, searcher provider, and we'll give it. Uh, we're going to just probably rename this to search provider is what we will call this. <coughs> and this control is used. So let's drop that on now. This control is used to uh, for tab to next reference and also for renaming. But I'm not going to use it for rename. I'm only going to use it for navigation. So I'm going to say true for navigation. Okay. Just have the next reference. Give it a good name. Call this uh, SP uh, Find Primitives. That. Give it a provider name. Find Primitives. That'll fill out the display name right there and description. Um, finds uh, matching primitives. <laughs> over here on the event side of things, we have check availability. We're, you, we've seen this all over the place, for Rory, right? This is in a lot of our plugin pieces where yeah. you drop something on you. You've got a check availability, and all this means is come back and tell Code Rush, tell the DX Core if you are available or, available or not. So I'm going to double click there to create an event handler for that. I'm also going to go with language supported. This is the first time you'll ever, you've seen me so far handle this event, language support. Most of the time, it's really just not a big deal, and we just let the availability, avail, availability check do all the work. But I'm going to come in here and add some explicit checks for language just to show you how to do that and how it might be useful. <coughs> and then we're going to come in here and we're going to handle the search references event. So that's what we'll start with. Now I'm going to actually write some code. Most of the time, I just, I just run and then write code while we're, we're debugging. But this time I'm going to write some code and start this out because it's going to require um, some other classes. So when you do this, when you work with a searcher provider, um, you need, if you're going to be efficient, you need to, to uh, create an enumerable uh, uh, to, uh, 
to enumerate through the uh, the other primitives you needed, and you need to create a filter to be able to um, to filter through that. And we have some tools for creating enumerables, but we need a filter that basically says, okay, tell us what elements you're, you're interested in. So we're going to build that. So <clears throat> let's start with our check availability first, because that's the easiest one. So I'll come in and say if uh, ea dot uh, element is a primitive expression, then we're going to come down and we're going to say ea dot uh, available equals true. It's as simple as that. Cool. Okay. So that is easy. Step one. So I'm curious, just just based on that, will that mean this is available on uh, string primitives as well? Or it will. And what will be what will be very interesting, Roy, is to check to see if this, in addition to working on numbers, actually works on all primitives. Right. Okay. Theoretically, based on the way we're going to write this, it should. We could make it so it only works on on um, uh, we could make it so it only works on. Um, hold on a second. So it only works on uh, on in thirty twos. The code would look, look sure. something like this. If primitive expression dot uh, what is it? Expression type. Expression type name. No. What was the thing we were just looking at? Primitive expression. It was. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. It was called primitive type. That's what it was. And we can come in here and say, is it equal to in 32? Then we're available. Okay. Right there. So hold on a second. I'm going to cough. I'm going to mute my microphone for a second. All right. Sorry about that. So we can do a check like that. So yeah, if, in case you haven't, you can't tell. I'm a little bit sick. Ray asked at the very beginning, you know, how are you doing? I'm like, you know, a little sick, a little sleep deprived, but kind of par for the course, right? <clears throat> So that's what our code there looks like. Over here, this is going to be pretty straightforward as well. Um, so let's see, what do we have in Havana Rx right here? <clears throat> language ID. So we can say if language ID equals, we can say C sharp, for example, like that, or, and let me show you what you can do if you don't want to work with the, let me just go back a second. You don't want to just type that in. Like this, this, this word, this word is coming from, if you want to know where all these, these unique strings are for the different language IDs, coming down here from the language combo box. So if you bring up a page where you can actually use it, like templates, you can see the list of all the different um, languages that are that you for corresponding to files that you've opened up in Visual Studio. So your list probably doesn't look like mine. It probably looks a little bit different. But these are the names of all the language um, service providers out there. Um, all the, the uh, I forget what they're called language extensions. Yeah, it's, this is a um, Visual Studio term, and that's why I'm not remembering it. But um, <clears throat> you can get you can get this this same thing out here by going to uh, devexpress.dxcore.constants.stir.language, <clears throat> and here they are. So now you can get to C sharp right there. And let's go ahead and we'll add this using statement here. Move that type call. So we'll come down here, we'll say if EA, and we'll say handled equals true. So yes, we're going to handle this. So we'll say or, and with this one we'll say C++, or <coughs> Visual Basic. So for those languages, we'll say yes, we support it. And, um, <coughs> and now we have um, search references, which is a little more complex. We, one of the event args that's coming in here is called search event args, EA. Um, Rory's guidelines for plug-in writing is, yeah, Rory says, and I totally agree with this, <laughs> exhaust the event args first before looking elsewhere, i.e. e.g. the code rush uh, properties. Okay, so we will do that. <clears throat> what do we have in EA? So we have a couple things. We have element, which we've seen before. We also have code active. And, 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 and I just wanted to point this out because if you look at the description for this, for code active, it says it corresponds to, <clears throat> hold on, let's bring it up again. In source files, it's the same as the element property. So for this, it really doesn't matter for, for this. However, in files, containing markup like ASP.NET code nuggets, right? What CodeActive will do is instead of giving you the HTML nugget, 
Code Active gives the corresponding code element inside the market, inside the markup. <clears throat> So something just to point out, you might might be useful. Yeah, that's know. an interesting one because I mean there was a point where I was I was just using elements every single time. Then I came to do some ASP.NET slash HTML work, and I would get the the code nugget was as you oh, sorry the the um, the angle bracket percent piece would be what I would get out of that. And I was trying to get to some some VB or some C sharp that was inside of that, and that's where I was going wrong. I should have been looking at the code active to get that information. Gotcha. Yeah. So that is definitely something that. We that you can look at and use. All right. If, am I also right in saying that that's, that's technically where um, <laughs> you use code active to get to, say, the JavaScript construct inside of a HTML page as well? Exactly. To generate JavaScript. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So let's check to see if we're, the starting point is a primitive expression. And if it is, we're totally expecting this to be true. But if it's not, we're going to get out. OK. Mm -hmm. Down here in EA, what do we have here in EA for references? What do we have here? We have add range, and we have add ranges. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to actually do work with add ranges, and this is going to allow us to specify for every reference we find something known as a file source range collection. Okay, which is just a collection, of, and here for add range, it just takes a file source range. And if you look at the name, um, uh, essentially that's what it is. You, it gives you a file and a source range. Those are the two elements that it combines together. Okay, we're going to have mul expect multiples of these, so they're going to use add ranges instead of add range. And we need to pass in our ranges. Let's declare this. Okay, I'm just adding a link to um, to the chat there. Um, it's the link for Alex Scorkin's site. In this particular case, a recent post he's done on file changes. And effectively, um, it's not quite what we're doing here, but it's the ability to affect many files at once. Most specifically, if some of those files are not loaded, so we've been using things like text documents and text view for things that are loaded. But when you want to rename something, for example, and you want to reach out into files you don't have open, then this particular um, post is particularly useful in understanding the options in that area. Have you muted yourself, Mark? Sorry, I did mute myself. I was coughing again while you were talking. So yeah, I was just going to say thanks, thanks, Roy, for that. That's a, again the reason why you're here because I would go for an hour <coughs> ignoring chat messages. Telling that me. was literally out yesterday. <laughs> what, what did you say? The the post in question there was literally just out yesterday. So it's very fortuitous that we happen to be stumbling in the same area. Oh, the thing I was going to say, though, is actually it's not quite the same area, at least with regards to the file change. So this is the file change. This is when we need to make changes in multiple files, right? I'm not sure if he's talking about the file source range in here. It doesn't look like he's talking about file source range in here. So it's slightly different. That's all I was saying when you asked if I was okay. muting it, is I was saying it's slightly different. A file source range collection is not the same thing as a ah. file the, the, um, the file change. This is just going to say, here's my file, and here's the source range in the file. It's just a way of saying these are different points of the code that, you, if you imagine, they, they could all be selected, for example. Sure. Which reminds me of a new feature I want to write. Oh, I'm not going to talk about it because we may ship it in. in it's maybe secret. Never mind. <laughs> so that's your clue. So um, uh, okay. it's, it's secret. <laughs> it's secret. And it, all right, guys. <laughs> that's it. Everyone, uh, quick poll on Twitter. What is the secret feature? <laughs> all right. So, oh, by the way, kids, holy cow. We have got an awesome feature that we're working on for 11.2. Anybody who works on this that's like, you know, not competition, send me an email um, at, uh, here we go, markm at devexpress.com. And uh, uh, this is like, you know, I, I just realized that people are going to be watching this in the future as well. So, so this is, you know, before 11.2, you know, asked to get in on the beta. And, um, and we'll send you some cool stuff that we're going to release in a little bit too. Um, <clears throat> NDA is currently required for this, which means you, you essentially have to sign something that says you're not going to talk about what we're going to do. This is the secret feature that didn't quite make 11.1, isn't it? Exactly. It didn't make 11.1, but holy crap, it's like I'm getting so excited by it because it's like really filling out and getting rich. And um, you know, There are people out there who don't believe there is a secret feature. <laughs> They were so disappointed when it didn't make it. 
Yeah. Cool. Well, so, this is, this so is we don't complete. like releasing things that aren't ready. You know? My hope is that people will be really crazy excited by what this does. So um, at any rate, we are. So I'm, I'm kind of secretly announcing it because I figure only the hardcore coders folks are going to be in on these these right here. So um, you know, we'll hope that our competition doesn't stumble upon this and uh, and uh, we'll try to see get a, get a peek at what we're doing. All right. <clears throat> so we've got some some source ranges. Now I said before I wanted the the uh, the scope of this to be uh, equal to the current source file. So I'm going to go to that source and get the uh, the active source file. <clears throat> so that's the scope I want to search through. I could make it bigger than that, but I'm worried a bit about performance, especially if the carrot's sure. on the number zero, right? And a large. So just solution. to be clear, when we can put any language element into this, we could put it inside of a block or inside of a, a method, anything like that, if we wanted to. But in this case, we're going to go with the file. Yes, that's true. Okay. We could actually absolutely, yeah, and it, which is interesting, right? You could actually say only within the method if you wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to create something that only did Tabnix reference, like for example, we could create a Tabnix reference that just did Tabnix reference on all of the 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 keywords we're on. So if we're on the if keyword, you could just tab and see all the other ifs inside. As an example, you could create Can I ask a really awkward question. Um, um, I'm curious <laughs> about my relationship with my mom, or no, 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 no nothing quite from that. Childhood. Um, no, I'm curious um, if we wanted to have a custom scope, which was, let's say, two <laughs> files that we knew, mm -hmm. you know, were the outer possible limits of this thing that we were searching for. Um, <laughs> can we construct some higher level object as the scope and just add the two files to it, or do we risk damaging anything there? Mm, oh, I see what you're saying. Can we add those elements to it? Yes. You can you can add them as long as they're not like a language element. Because if you add them used to a language element, it's going to go in and say, well, your parent is now me, right? It goes right. and call into the add node call. So <clears throat> it does some reparenting things there. So you don't want to do that. But if you instead use something that just you would just have held on to source files, you can specify that. Or we could just pass in the source files as well to the, the, the filtering method that we're about to create. Okay, well, we'll see how that goes anyway. Maybe it will become more obvious. So, so here's what we've got. We've got a scope. We've got some ranges. We've got a primitive expression. Now what I need is essentially a for each right here. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. That was on the clipboard. Let's go ahead and change some of this up. So what I want to do instead is I want to, I want to create a call that find like matching. <clears throat> I don't want to pass into it primitive expression and scope. And maybe I want to change the order of those, I think. Scope, primitive expression. Like that, and then assuming you know we we we've um, oh and th this I'm sorry is going to return instead of this I want it to return a primitive expression. Let me just, just mark that here. Copy the clipboard, escape, paste like that, and then let's paste this and just call it that primitive expression. Maybe I'll just call this primitive because I already have another primitive expression in here. So for each primitive and find matching, right? So we found a primitive. Then we want to come down here to ranges, <coughs> call add. And then we want to create a new file source range. Okay. We want to pass in the primitives file node and its range property as well. Oops. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay, and that so we're going to be collecting a list of these ranges effectively. Exactly. Now, here's the thing. I said I want my scope to be active source file. I'm using file source range here, right? It's almost overkill. Because the file is always going to be the same because I'm only looking in the source file. Right now, I'm okay with that. And the reason I am, Rory, is because I, later I might experiment and play around and say, let's blow this wide open. And instead of saying active source file, I might say like active project instead. Sure. Make sense? Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so that's why I'm kind of doing this. Um, there was another event, by the way, that we didn't handle. Let me just talk about that for a second. And that was here search preview references. And the difference between search references and search preview references is this is for essentially only the references in the active file. And if I were to double click this and look at its uh, EA event args, notice mm -hmm. they're different from this one. Search event args, search for preview event args. Let's look at what EA has. It's got add range and add ranges. <clears throat> but look, what it look at what it takes. A source range collection, okay, comes in here. Whereas this one takes a file source range collection. The distinction right, okay. being this needs to know what file it's in. So 
Someone makes the assumption all the ranges are in this file. In the same file, right? So it seems overkill, and yes, it is overkill for, for the spec, but because I, you know, first two things. One is we're putting the source out so people can play with this, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to, if I, if I were to do it down here, it would be simpler, the code would be simpler, however, and not be overkill. However, it would be harder to play with it and change sure. the scope. And so that's what I'm doing. We've got a quick question. Um, we started at, and we indicated that this particular feature will be used both for tab to next reference and I forget the second feature that it was potentially rename. going to be used. Rename was the other Rename. Option. So we were going to, we, we skipped out on that one ourselves this time, didn't we? Right. Um, but the, the question is, um, by, in, by inference, if, if we say we are going to use this for tab to next reference, will it automatically work with highlight references as well? Uh, I think it will. I think the yeah, answer is so yes. So when they're in the same file, you'll get that, that, I think it's slightly pink purple bar, just highlights underneath. You have to invoke the command. It's the code rush command for highlight references, not the Visual Studio one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. yeah, let's, let's test that. I, I think it will is the answer. So, okay. All right. So let's declare fine matching. <coughs> let's get rid of this so we can see more code. <coughs> all right. So scope is coming in. Uh, primitive expression is coming in. So let's do this. If scope equals null, uh, or if primitive expression equals null, then we want to do a yield break. YB gives us that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next, we want to come in and we want to create a new element enumerable. Okay, that's inside structural parser. Okay, this is for enumerating elements. And we have an option to pass in scope, use recursion, and a filter. <coughs> And we want to put a filter in to this is what we want. So scope is simply the starting parent node, which we're going to, we've already got. Filter, we're going to create a new, call this our, I, for some reason, I'm going to go with what I'm feeling here, my super primitive filter. I want to put the word filter on, super on the beginning of that. I'm not sure why. And we want to pass in the, the primitive that we're trying to match to that because we're going to store that and then check with our filter if that's okay or not. Um, all right, I'm going to not go crazy. I've decided I'm editing it on the way. And then we use recursion, yes, which means I want to drill in, drill down. But we'll declare that in a second. I mean, we'll, we'll declare the um, primitive filter in a second. Um, and let's call this the, uh, the primitives enumerable right here. We'll come down here. We'll just uh, say if uh, that's null, then we're going to do another yield break. And then we're going to come down here. We'll do a for each on this. And we're going to see... For each uh, object, and call this element, inside that enumerable, we'll say if element is a primitive expression, <coughs> then we want to do a yield return, yr, gives me yield return, and then we'll say element, but typecast it as a primitive expression. Okay, let's declare our primitive filter. So here's our primitive filter, <coughs> and I'm going to call this the um, the source. Is what I'm going to do. So this is this is the source element we're trying to match, right? So the idea is this, right? We we start right, matching. So we start in here in search references. We're basically going to do a search for all matching primitive expressions. This is what we're passing in, the active one. And so what we yeah. want to do is we want to come in here and we want to say uh, for, uh, oh, one thing we need to do, by the way. So I, I actually was talking to one of the devs about this. Check this out. This looks for an I-element filter. I use declare class. By golly, it didn't give me this. Hmm. It should have figured that out. We will fix yeah. this for 11.2. So anyway, we, that's why we're getting a red underline there. Let's implement that interface. Let me just clean this up a bit so it matches the style I'm more comfortable with. Boom, boom, boom. OK, so we need to implement these pieces. So uh, what I was doing is I was stepping back. How do, what's happening in the filter? We're passing in. The source is the element we're starting with. This is the starting node. In fact, let's maybe call it that instead, the, the, the starting primitive instead, okay, or the initial, the origin, I don't know, source, I'll go back to source. All right, so then we'll come in here and we'll say, let's declare an initialized field for a field for that, 
So there we have that. That's set up. And, um, and now let's go in here for skip children and apply. Those are the two numbers we have to do. So the idea is this. A filter is called in, as, from the enumerable as, as, we, uh, as it goes through, as it enumerates the source code. And, and two methods are called. One is skip children to determine whether or not we need to skip the children or we should enumerate into them. And the answer yeah. for this is always going to be uh, false. We always want to go into all the children. Okay? I guess we could do something like saying, well, are you in an XML node? Then yes, don't go inside. If it's like an XML well, this would be interesting. I mean, it's quite um, useful, for example, if um, you maybe would skip children if you were only looking for methods and you were looking for them in a class level. There's not going to be methods inside methods. So there's no point going into the children. Uh, that's right. If you're only looking for methods, right, not in the context we're looking for primitives, but yes, yeah, you're only, yes, that would be the exact context for this. Or maybe, yeah, exactly, or maybe you only wanted to look inside methods, and so if you came to a property, you might say, okay, skip children, for example. Yeah. Just to, and it's just for performance reasons, right, just so we don't do more work than we have to do. Okay? And then cool. apply, basically, the question here is, uh, is this an element we want to work with? Return true, if so, like that. Sure. And so what I want to do is I want to come in here and I want to say element as, and <laughs> we can go with primitive expression, okay? However, remember, Rory, we were talking about the difference between the lighter elements and the yeah. heavier elements, and then we also talked about the interfaces, right? So, sure. so, let, so let, let's, just, let's just regurgitate that again in here. So from a, from a conceptual standpoint, we have language element descendants. These are the heavier objects. Easy to work with, but, but, but big. These always exist for the active file. Always, well, let's do this, put this on the next line. Always exist for the active file and open files. Okay, so the second that you open a text document, so to speak, or, or your code does, you, that, that set of data will be passed for you and you'll have a, a, a right. list or a chain, the hierarchy, as it were, of language elements that you can access. Then you have these light element, elements. And um, and these are um, they're lightweight, uh, fewer properties, way less memory. And these are used the files on disk and referenced assemblies. All right. So they're like dehydrated versions of the language element. Exactly. Beautiful description. I love it. Yeah. And you can hydrate, right? You can go from, from these, you can hydrate from a light element to a language element. And then you have these, um, uh, these interfaces. Stick an I in front of the uh, language, language element name. And, and the interfaces are, are implemented by the light elements. Actually, by both. By both of these. All right. So we were talking before. So I could do this. Element is primitive expression, right? And then just go and say declare it. However, if it's a light element, this as cast will fail. And then we'll come back with null. Yeah. And and we were talking before about maybe wanting to extend this, extend this out to only work within the, uh, you know, I'm sorry, to work within the project instead of the, just the current file. So yeah, so, so so the version you've got at the moment, we wouldn't ma it wouldn't matter because as you said, the current file, the active file, already has the the fully hydrated the language element item. But we're going to give source out that is easy to extend, easy to play around to change that source. Mm -hmm. and the moment items are found outside of this file, they'll be of the form light element. So we're going to have to start using the I primitive or the the, um, the interface based variation, so that that doesn't fall over and break. Did yes. I get that right? <laughs> yes. I'm exactly. following. It's good. <laughs> so we've got a typecast. So we say if that's with the, if that's equal to null, then we want to uh, return false. Okay. And then we want to say we want to do the check. We want to say 
if primitive expression dot primitive type equals our source, the one we saved, the one we're starting with, right? It's okay, primitive yep. type. And we want to say, uh, let's just copy that to clipboard, paste it down because I think it's a little faster. If the names are the same, control B because it does paste for replace. Then if those two conditions are true, then we can say return true. Otherwise, we can say return false. It's not unconditional, so we can just do that. So that's essentially what we're doing. Okay? And that's it. So here, let me just take this comment and move it up here just in the notes so we can kind of see. Okay, let's do this too. Let's uh, move type to file. So we've got our own file called room primitive filter. <coughs> It's just kind of a review here. Okay, so so the, the recommendation is if we're, you're kind of doing this kind of working with source code and you're going to work with source code that's not on, that may not be open in the, in the editor, then what we want to do is we want to work with the I version, the interfaces. And then that will give you access to something that could be a real language element or could be a light element. And the, the real way to find out is to step through the code and see what it is, look at it, evaluate it. So <laughs> in the same way as um, we say that with events, you should always check the EA, uh, the event arcs first. Perhaps it's fair to say that if you don't need anything specific, you should try to work with the, um, the interfaces here, the I primitive expression rather than the full versions, because mm -hmm. you're less likely to come across as less likely to fall over and go wrong because you accidentally reach for a property that isn't in the element that you've actually got instantiated. And then if you need more, then you reach out and you do your language restore element. Yes. I would agree with that. So let's do this. Let's go in and let's run it <coughs> and see how we're doing. So let's set a breakpoint. <coughs> set a breakpoint on um, <coughs> the new language supported. That was fine matching. You know, yeah, I guess we can stop there too. Quick point there, check availability. Search references. <coughs> so those are the interesting breakpoints. All right. Let's go over into here, open up our object initializer test. All right, so we'll come in here. <coughs> And we will hit the tab key, and no breakpoints are hit. And the reason why, so initially I just, so I, so I have done prep to this, right? I've, I've actually gone through this once and done this. A lot of times when I do this, by the way, we're like, there's no prep, and you can totally tell. I'm like, whoa, what's <laughs> that? And so I was doing that this morning, and I was like, wait, what's going on? And I thought, oh, wait a second, tab to Nick's reference, I was remembering that it had a context on it that it may be stopping us from getting in here. So <clears throat> tab takes reference. Here's the context. In fact, if we come over here to look, look at it in more detail, you can see if we're in an identifier or an MVC action using, and, and then we go on to more, <clears throat> more elements. If we look at this in here, we see, oh, tab next reference is only going to fire, is only going to even fire reference next if these things are true. That's so fine, just the do, existing feature doesn't understand the extra piece we've put in place, and it's trying to save us some uh, calculations. Yeah, we are not in an in an, inside an identifier right now, so it's not firing. So what we could do is we could come and create a new shortcut here. I'll do a Control-Alt-Shift-P uh, um, for primitive navigation. We'll come in here, we'll just get next uh, reference. Oh, sorry, reference, reference next. Like that. And uh, and we could just say okay like that. And we'll just see what happens. The other thing I wanted to say is what's it the find all usage? What is it? There it is. Highlight reference control alt u. Let's hit that one and see what happens if we hit control alt u. That's got a similar problem with in identifier. Oh, does it too? I didn't see it. All right, so we can't test that one either. We'll have to go change that one. You're right. Absolutely. Okay. So um, so let's do this. Let's first do the control alt shift p. And now we're actually inside check availability. 
So we can say, okay. is it available? True. Let's run. Search references. So let's step through here. We're on a primitive expression, just like we're expecting. We're going to create a new source for, uh, file source range collection. Here's the active file, single digit multiplier.cs. That's the scope. Mm -hmm. Here's our, our font for each. Oops, I hit F10. I wanted to drill inside of that. Okay, well, we've got a breakpoint anyway, so we're good. Um, sco scope's all good. Primitives enumerable. That's good. So now we come down here. If element is, we found one. So there's one we just found. And then we're going to return it. And now we're going to call add new range on that and, and pass in that range right there. So let's run it. <clears throat> let's run it. Okay. And uh, very and so, nice. So we're there. Now, if I have the tab key, tab actually now works. Damn, that's and, cool. <laughs> and the, reason, the reason it does is because there's there's a there's two states, right? This tab that's happening now is because we've set up all of these um, these these links. Essentially, is what they are. They're called these are called nav links, is what I think they're called. So these yeah. all been set up. So now tab and chip tab, tab work. However, if I'm if I move um, hold on, let's do it again. Control Shift P, and then I move out and then come back in. Well, I was seeing a different behavior earlier today where it was I hit Enter and then oh, that's working too. Okay, so all of that's okay. So anyway, so I was seeing a slightly different behavior today, but it's all working okay, to, okay right now. So that's not bad. What I really want to do though is I want to fix that tab binding and also the highlight all usages because I'd really like to see that working too. So let's do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this down, and we're going to fix this by dropping a context provider, and then we're going to change the context. So you, you've seen us do this before, Rory, where we said, okay, well, we need a context. So we come in here, and we're going to grab a context provider, drop it on, let's bring up properties, CTX in um, primitive. Sure. Well, actually, before I do that, let's see if we already have a context that says in primitive. So editor clipboard, actually editor code, not in something else, but just in here, it's got a whole bunch of ins. Yeah, so I'd expect to see in primitive there, and it's not there. So it looks like we do not have that already built in as a context. So let's add that as a new context. Uh, satisfied if the caret is inside a primitive expression. Now, as I write this, you know what I'm thinking, Rory, is I'm thinking yeah. this is actually one we might want to ship in the core because it's, yeah. it's useful to us now. It might be useful to others. And to put it inside this plugin is is not helpful to other people. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. So for now, it's going to be in this plugin because we need it. But mm -hmm. what might happen is when we release 11.2, we decide to put this feature in because I like this feature. I think this is something we would ship in 11.2. What we'll do is we will take this context out uh, sure. and, and replace it with and move it to the other file. So there'll be a source code change. In brief happen. discussions that I've had in the past with, with uh, Mr. Skorkin and, and other devs, it's been suggested that um, the provider name is effectively a lookup index within a given uh, section. So, if we give it a name here, and it gets the same name when it goes in the uh, in the core, theoretically only one of them will win. But if they do exactly the same thing, we're still safe. We won't True. fall over. We won't crash. Right. We'll, it'll all continue. We'll yeah, likely right. take this out anyway at that point. But just in case people, you know, make their own and and, and have similar kind of issues, that's that's how these it's things true. work. Yeah, we did have extensive discussions with the devs about this because you know, the, of course. The concerns are what we're putting source code out in the community side, but then we're going to wrap that into the next version. How are we going to, you know, make sure that people who have downloaded the community site when they get created the next version, everything's still running seamlessly? So we've had yeah. um, it's pretty extensive discussion of that. We we're, we we feel pretty confident that that's all going going to work. And uh, when you get 11.2 comes out, <clears throat> if you've already downloaded some of these, that all the features will still work, even if you have old versions of the plugins still on your machine. So context satisfied, we'll double click over here and we'll say um, uh, uh, if EA, uh, we don't have element here so we're going to have to go into code rush. 
cooters.source.active is a primitive expression. We would say ea.satisfied equals true. So now we have the context. Wow, that was complicated. <laughs> Not too hard. It's just more of just you know busy work filling out the properties, right? That was the main sure. thing that we had to do there. All right. The probably the more complicated piece will actually be to go into. Whoops. What do we got here? Oh, I hate it when that happens. All right. So there's something going on here where this is not supposed to happen, but what's going on is this code rush is uh, is loading up the um, the plugins that we are building inside the same instance that we're building them from, and I'm not sure what the trigger is for that. Not that one. Let me grab the other one. So, but we'll go out, we'll delete it, we'll have to restart Visual Studio. Remove tab is what I called it. Let's close this down. Come in here and delete. <coughs> Try again. There we go. It's gone. Start up a new instance of Visual Studio. Yeah, I, Roy and I develop in a slightly different way. Roy develops plugins so that they don't load by, by default. Yeah. And he does not have this problem at all. And this is a this is a new kind of change. We need to we definitely need to go and fix this. It only it's, it's it only affects plugin developers, right? It's not anything that really impacts True, yeah. at all. So let's see. Go in here. File. Open. Project and primitive tab is what it is. There's the solution. All right, and let's run it. Yeah, I want to see that highlight all uses is work works. I think it's going to, and that's what's really cool about this. If it does. Right, we're talking about a small change that we're we're adding. Right, we're simply you know the essence. Although that, yes, there were some you know other we had to create some classes. It wasn't as straightforward as some of the other plugins that we built in the past. Right, mm -hmm. but but with with a, with a little bit of code that goes through and says okay, let's just find all the primitives and just compare some simple values to see if it matches the one we're on. Right, we're we're yeah. talking about something that's making that, that's having significant impact on usability. Um, Okay, so here we go. Let's see. We have this one. Let's delete that that control alt shift p. So we have the tab and the reference next. So let's change the context of these. So this before, right? This is an install node, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody that installs this is going to have to come in and make this change right there. And yeah. I'm going to take a screenshot and send that to you. Okay. Here's a picture of Carl Franklin out of his car recording .NET Rocks. That was from <laughs> earlier today. I got a, uh, a command from uh, Julie Lerman to go out and take a picture of him. Because Carl's ha hanging out with us, staying with us. So. All right, so um, all right, here we are. We're way over here. There's, there's the picture. We will get that to you. So you can you have that screenshot. So we say need to add in primitive. Shift tab has the same issue as well. So that's if you start off by pressing Shift Tab and Shift Tab, and Highlight References is going to need the same change in Primitive. Oops, there it is. Let's click OK. So that's the cool thing about the context. So now, if we hit Tab, there you go. Tab just works. Let's hit the Control Alt. What is it? Control Shift U. Oops, sorry. Got to put the carrot on it. Control Shift U. Is that what it was? Control U. Let's see what the Control button is. Shift U, perhaps. I mean, Control Alt U. Alt All right, Control Alt U. Look at that, Roy. There you go. Awesome. Put the carrot on the zero. Control Alt U. Highlight all the references. Hit Tab to next reference. Let's go to the string. So yeah, the string is the one I'm really curious about. Hold on a second. Introduce format item. Oops. Let's do the same thing here because they're not the same string. And Let's hit the tab key. <laughs> so on. let's get exciting. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What do you want to say? Well, I'm just saying that in some cases that's not what you require. You might want to be, um, uh, depending on your editor settings, you may emit tabs or spaces when you hit the tab key into codes. You may be wanting to inject extra spaces into your string. Is there a way we can determine the difference between, say, being maybe on the quote mark versus inside the string? Yeah. We can do that. That's simple. Just in the um, in the in the uh, in the uh, availability check, we can make that make that check. Uh, let, let me just come in here. I just want to I just want to come in here and look at some other primitives here, just to show that it's all working. 
the way that we were expecting to put a false in there and a false there. So we can even come in here on the false and hit the tab key to go through all the falses in the print file, right? So from uh, and then also same way you know Control Alt U highlight all of all of these. So from yeah. my perspective, this is huge. I love this, right? We've just within well, what's our time? Fifty minutes, and a lot yeah. of that was explaining. We just came in and massively changed this, so it might be so it was more useful. Similarly, yeah. you could do the same thing here, Rory. Right? You want to, you're on a throw statement. Go to all throw. Go to all the throw keywords. Right? You could totally do that. Right? There are some really cool stuff we can do in this space. All right. So let's let's answer your question here. So if we're inside, I have never been in a string and wanted to actually stick a tab in it, but we can do that. I'll show you how to do that. We're just going to come in here in our uh, availability check, which is here. Right? We'll add some code. So we'll come in here, hit the tab key, and now what we want to do is to do something like this. Um, if primitive expression dot primitive type equals primitive type dot string. Yep. And let's see, then we want to do a little bit more. We need to then say where they find out where the caret is. So let's get to here at least. So I'm running. Okay, now we're in there. We know it's a string. So now we want to see what do we have in here? Name range. Okay, name range. Let's see what name range is equal to. Let's go into uh, did it show it to me right there? From 47 to 70. So that is 47 to 70. Let me just uh, let me just return out of here, and I want to go back and look at the code. So we're 47 to 70 run. I want to see if that's inside the string or outside the string. So here it corresponds. Yeah, look at that. So there's 47. 47 is the outside. So we're I think you're saying is look, if we are on the outside of this thing, let me just running at the breakpoint. So here, if I do here, nothing's happening. I have to actually be in. For now, tab next reference is not working. You hit return uh, oh, rather than set true. Yeah. That's what's going on. So our strings are excluded at the moment. Hold on. Let's get rid of this and run it. <laughs> so let me see. If I'm if I'm here, yeah. So tab next reference, if I'm working, it works there. But if I'm inside, it does not. So let's look at seeing if we're inside it. So what we want to do is we want to say um, breakpoint here. We want to see if the carrot is after the start. So yeah. if code rush dot carrot dot dot for the start dot hold on there's an active in here I think no uh, location um, source point there it is location there thank you dot oh that's not helping us come on different one all right let's not go with there's carrot. Source points. there's a source point there that's it okay great thank you okay source point. I should have guessed source point. I've used that so many times before. All right, and so what we want to see is if the source point is greater than the name range dot start, not equal to but greater than, and then in that case we're going to say available is true. Oops. <coughs> Let's see if that works. I'm just going to just going to run it. So uh, that's not going to work, Mark. You nope. need an else clause on there because otherwise it'll fall through and still be true. You are brilliant, and that's why I'm here. That's why you're here. Sorry, <laughs> that's why I'm here. You could test. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I suppose you have to break out as well. All right, so let's 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 do this, and we can say uh, just return like that. That's what we need to do. So we're only available for there. So what you meant by saying break out? I think so. Yes. Okay. All right. So let's run it one more time. Starting right here. Tab. Tab. I. I, I totally reversed the logic. My bad. My bad. So let's do it one more time. Yeah. Here we go. Boom. So what we want to do is we want to say if it's equal to the start. And that's your. That's the code change that you're you're looking for. Yeah. Right there. Right. So here we go. So if we're inside, at the tab key. Oh, nothing happens. But if I'm here, so we got have we have we eaten the key? Are we not yes. passing it through? Exactly. What's happening is this: we are matching the context, which says we're on a primitive, 
Okay. Mm. So we have to change our context down here for are we on a primitive, right? And so now this is getting so you're, we'd have to change this context. So, so so the answer we could do it, but I don't like the word imprimitive anymore because it is it's it doesn't quite match the um, uh, the the word imprimitive implies anywhere in a primitive, and now we're kind of changing that a little bit. Yeah. But but that's how we would do it. So it's not too hard, as you can see, the code is not too hard. What I'm going to actually do though is I'm going to like comment all that out because I'm actually yeah. I mean it was a, a, a tiny thing really. It's just a, hypothetically it can be done, and you can see the beginnings of exactly how that would be done there. So that's good. Yeah. So what I'm just going to do is comment all that out right there and just go to EA available and look for the truth. So you can see how we can do that. The um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, if you do want a tab inside of there, you can go elsewhere and put a tab in, and then go back and copy it to the clipboard, cut it, and then go in and paste it. Yeah, it's a bit of a pain in the butt, but how many times do you need to do that versus It's pretty many, rare, yeah. Yeah, versus how many times do you really want to go through and see all the other references? That's right. The same piece, right? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of that, hitting the tab to the top and say. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, chars. So we can try that. Try, try that and creating a new char. What if we work with min value? You know, the min value is just a regular, this would work anyway. But let's change this to uh, like a, for example, char bar 2 is a, char bar 3 is, 4 is a, there, there we go. Tab, 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 that all works. So yeah. That's pretty good. I hate it when we actually finish without anything to extend on. Would you have any questions on this, Roy? We do have a, a, just a brief question is, is you you we write these plugins every week sometimes two a week and um, the question is does how does this not slow code rush down okay we've got so many things being added in time after time after time how is it that all of these extra pieces don't slow things down horribly yeah so uh, that's a good question and the um, excuse me, I was just taking some water the 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 answer is that uh, um, we put a lot of emphasis on essentially efficient, efficiently marshalling, and when I say marshalling, I mean uh, guiding with wisdom, I guess is the way I would use that, not sure. in terms of the Win32 marshalling, um, but, but eff efficiently marshalling all of the plugins, right, and, and really emphasis on the word efficiently. Um, and, and then also safely is the other, the other kind of guiding piece that we have here. Um, mm -hmm. Why doesn't it slow it all down? Um, because uh, in this specific case, right, the check availability test only happens when I hit the tab key. So when I hit the tab key, what happens? We go in and we check to see is it available. The second thing that that, that the second bit of code that we have, and, and this is just really fast, right? Is the element sure. that we're on the active element is it a primitive expression? Well, the reason that's fast is because there's been a certain amount of parsing of the code done already. We've already got a cache. Yeah, uh, of what your code looks like, and it's yeah. considerably easier and quicker to read from that than it is to reparse the code. And we only have to reparse the elements of the code that change. So it's a very simple, very very small delta between each change that you make, and certainly the parser can usually keep up pretty well with with any changes you're making. Now, now because of our simple availability test, when I get tab key here, it's going to say it's available, but there's only one, and it's going to show me simply by highlighting it. But I'm totally okay with that because that's the exact same behavior if I'm on a, a variable that only appears once. So I'm sure. I'm actually okay with that. So the availability test is fast. The second thing is. The second hit is search references. That's potentially big, right? Because we've got this enumerable, we're going through it. However, yeah. however, again, we by giving you this element enumerable, we're working on ways to very, very quickly go through and enumerate elements, right? Where we pass in a filter and our filter come in, we go into the filter and we check to see should we skip children or not. We there are opportunities to improve efficiency that are that are here that, that a plugin writer can can use. So from from the standpoint of efficiency, really, the if if you're if if you are thinking that, you know, as I add all these in, it's just going to slow down. The answer is no, it's not because it's extremely efficiently designed. Um, when, if we were to to multiply the number of plugins that are installed by a factor of ten, it would probably have no perceivable. And, and I'm saying increasing by an order of magnitude, right? We're not saying we're not saying. So I'm saying I'm not going from like 50 plugins to 500 plugins. You would you probably not see any perceivable difference, as long as the plugins were all written efficiently like the ones we've shown you. Sure. Right. In fact, I think we saw your your plugin folder earlier when you were deleting that that extra copy you had. You still got the plugins from previous runs that we've done previous webinars. I, I noticed mm -hmm. they're all still there. They're not been deleted because they're not really getting in the way. Yep. Yes. 
when we when we see efficiency problems, Rory, it is not in in our architecture. It is it is almost always well. I, I that's not entirely true. In the past, we have seen problems with our architecture, right? Mm -hmm. But this this issue of being this focus on extreme efficiency is huge for us, right? When we get like anybody complaining about performance, we'll throw easily one dev full time on it till it's fixed. Easily sure. one dev. And sometimes up to four devs, right? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll throw as many devs as it takes on, on an efficiency problem to solve it. So as a result, Well, it's a pretty simple equation, isn't it? We produce a productivity tool. If for some reason that slows you down, that's a big problem. That's right. it's pretty much numero uno. And, 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 and if, if that were to be an experience for, 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 for anyone for a significant amount of time, like we didn't fix it immediately for them, mm -hmm. that would impact us negatively, right? Buzz yeah. would be, you know, the opposite of what it currently is, right? As a result, sure. if somebody says something outrageous like code rush is slow, right? What we end up doing is saying, you get it. We we throw tech support people, we throw devs at that problem. We solve that problem immediately. Like within, you get a turnaround on a on a. If you have performance that's re, that you can get us details on, um, our turnaround time on solving that performance problem is is about five days or less, because yeah. of it's it's a huge priority. Performance, stability, memory use, all of those things are big for us, right? If you see issues where you, you feel like we are not meeting your expectations in those areas, tell us, give us details, because we are so on that stuff. That's a higher priority than features, anything else. Mm -hmm. So Excellent. back to that you know, original question. Yeah, you could. I feel confident that you could take your number of plugins, multiply it by 10, and you would see no perceivable change in the performance of Visual Studio because of how efficiently we marshal and manage all the plugins that are out there. I think you can multiply by 100, but you wouldn't see any noticeable difference. The only thing you might see is if we had a lot of plugins that were doing a lot of checks every time the caret moved or something like that, right? Where they were handling caret move, right? As opposed to code rush coming in and saying, here, let me do a check availability for you, right? There's sure. a lot that we have. We've just done a lot of performance issues, perform, performance things on this. Think about it, Roy. We ship 200 over 200 refactorings and code providers. When you include the code providers, it's 250 different plugins, or at least it's probably not that much in reality. It's probably less than that because some plugins, some physical assemblies have multiple features inside of them. Sometimes we do that, but it's mm -hmm. 250 different <clears throat> active elements that are all checking as you move the caret to see if they're available or not. And and we work really hard to make it so that you cannot detect. You, you just can't detect where the, where we're, we're chugging, you know, where we're doing that performance stuff. We, yeah. we, we work to be as efficient as possible. So it's like the five-minute answer to, you know, I, could, <laughs> I should have started with short answer. No, it'll have no impact. Fair it's enough. Impact. So that means short answer. Anything else? Um, uh, yeah, certainly Dev's threatening to write hundreds of plugins to prove you wrong. <laughs> Do it. I think he'll fail. <laughs> Do it. You know, I mean, that's, you know. Hey, that's cool, man. We'd a, like to see that. It's, it's an fun. awesome stress test for us. We should do that anyway, right? Yeah. But I'm just telling you, what I, based on what I know about the architecture, I think it's highly unlikely that, that by loading up on more plugins, you would see any performance. And if there was, if, if you did find that surly Dev, that would be a bug that we would fix. Yeah. Right? You, I you, think he's Coder should be able to handle, DX Core should be able to handle, Two to five thousand plugins all loaded at once without any performance, noticeable performance hit, as long as the plugins are all written like this, right? And so sure. efficiently. Okay. <clears throat> so that's it. If you do find performance issues, right, you can uh, uh, talk to us because we can probably help you find faster ways to do what you're doing, what you need to do, or maybe we fix them. Any other questions, Rory? Uh, we have one. I don't know how easy this one is to answer. Uh, we obviously have to modify. Um, well, we didn't. I suppose ultimately we didn't modify our context. We added a new context and then we sort of set that up in settings. The question right. was relates to: Is there a programmatical way to set or unset a key bindings contexts? So if you wanted to have yeah. your plugin come in with a context that it was new and set up some default keystrokes, that is interesting. <clears throat> Let's see if we can do that. Um, that is currently, by the way, not the model we recommend because we like to give developers control over that. Yeah. But, <clears throat> let's see what we can do. Um, let's close down the instance that's running. The, the tricky bit is that often, 
you've now talking about a plugin that modifies the context of a shortcut yep. or is creating a shortcut of its own, which is maybe yep. a separate issue again. The difficulty is it has to do this without any certainty as to what the other plugins around it have as their I requirements. Yeah. You kind of have to work on only the basis of what you know Code Rush's defaults to be. Yeah, I was just hoping to see like a shortcuts or key, maybe key binding, key. Get all bindings, all registered bindings. Should be. Let's play with that. <clears throat> all right. So let's set a breakpoint here and run. See what we can get. Right. Yeah, this is an interesting question because yeah, I have no idea. Let's let's see what we can get. <clears throat> All right, so all bindings is here. Let's see what we got. Oh, hey, Rory, I'm not sure if I've talked to the devs about this, but when for naming heuristics for for each, we have all bindings. See the word yeah. all in front of it. Sure. I want I want to, I want the name to just be binding. Can you just send me a note about that? Yeah. Can you talk to the devs about that. And what do we have inside binding here? Binding dot command equals reference next. So the breakpoint here. Run. Oh shoot, I missed it. I the the current execution point was already past that point. We we need to start again. We're in the initialized plugin. So current execution was down there. I hit run. I should have moved it back up to here. So yeah, um, to the four each. I mean. All right, so let's try one more time. Pretty sure that's the correct command name right there. So um, if that's correct, we should see a breakpoint right here. Oh, we're here at the breakpoint. Okay, so we're here. So now let's look at context. Ah, no context? What do I have? Parameters. Seriously, no context is available in the binding. I wonder if that's because it's implemented by the plugin at a higher it may level. Maybe an internal mechanism. There was um, a get all bindings, I think, in this context. You're right. So matching this context, so it would internally evaluate that. Perhaps not exposing it. At so this it time. looks like it's not exposed under I command key binding. It looks like we do not have access to that. Something with regards to context there, so that's a little disappointing. I, I was really excited and hoping we were going to get really close. Do we have a um, <coughs> codebrush key dot add? <coughs> okay. The answer is it looks like you cannot do it at this point, at least not just simply by exploring. We can, um, we might want to send me a note of this too and see if there's a programmatic way to alter the context of it. I guess one way you could do it, you know, <clears throat> one hack uh, would be to read in the uh, shortcut settings. <laughs> you read my mind. File, make a change, yeah. then call. Coderage dot options dot change options change. What is it? Reload. There it is right there. Reload uh, all. Yeah, reload. Yeah. Or you say reload and pass in the options page name. Yeah. Which we would have to figure out by where it is. So <clears throat> so we could do that and reload just that piece. And if that was interesting to you and you wanted to pursue that, we can give you the string name. We can tell you what research with the string name is for that. So you can just you can probably work it out from the settings XML folder because most pages, I believe, work out their they yeah. say to an initial file representative so you, of that. Name. So that would be the hack to 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 make that change programmatically. Um, there may be another way to do this. I know that our installer, I think, has the ability. To, I don't know if it has the ability to merge settings in like this, but that there might be a way to get access to that. But for now, it looks like. Looks like there's no real great, awesome, efficient way to make that change. 
So yeah, that would be a, um, um, also remind me about that, Lori, question for the devs. Where, where's context in I command key bind? So, all right. Um, let's see. Let me see. Are there any, while you're typing, Lori, let me just try to see if there are any other questions we haven't answered yet. <clears throat> Oh, more interested to add his own shortcuts, his own action in code. Okay, so one of the things that you can do, so if you want to add a shortcut so it actually shows up and is something that customers can change, so that is, uh, um, yeah, I think you're going to have the same problem because we don't have a, uh, on all bindings, we don't have, um, I, don't, I think you're going to run the same problem in terms of adding your shortcut to it. I think that's all implemented by the engine that that uh, that is registered for the I command. Uh, um, well actually, it's not for that. What is the uh, let's look at key again? Key is keyboard services. There's probably an interface that is that is, is I keyboard services. I bet, and there's an engine out there that uh, that implements it. Let's see if that works right. I keyboard services. Yeah, no, it's not. I don't know. Okay. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so with regards to adding your own, what I think I would recommend doing there is, let me just I'm stop debugging here a second. What I would recommend considering at least if you wanted to do that, and I, you know, let me comment this out. Basically what we're talking about here, so we're talking about a a need to modify settings programmatically. You, you know, for example, merge templates, shortcuts, um, <clears throat> other settings. So this may this may come in a future version. Or, uh, actually, DX Core. It's something we have considered adding, and uh, we've talked about this. Uh, it's it's not prioritized. It's, it doesn't have high priority right now, but it is something we're talking about. There's an ongoing conversation about that. If, however, you want to hard code a shortcut, what you can do is come in to your design surface, and in here, handle the. Uh, there's a key press to that. And there's also a key down event as well. So uh, what is it? Editor, editor. And for more information on that, you can see our previous uh, feature workshop on easier identifier. That's where we did a bit of handling of that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's right. So key press event. So this is. I thought there was a key down, but I, mean, I think I'm just remembering mouse down. So there's key pressed, and we can handle this event. And inside of here, there's a method called eat key, which if you call it, nobody else will see it. So what you can do is you can come in here and say if uh, EA dot and then do start doing your checks. Like if control key down and EA dot, um, what is it? Uh, to check you check some of the other ones. Key code equals something like 32 or something like that. I think key code is new. Is that right? Yeah, it's new. So that would be like the, I think the space bar firing, control space. Then we could set you know some sort of piece there and then eat that key. So it doesn't go in. Very important, you want eat key here, not out here, otherwise no keys get in. So you could hard code something like that. But the disadvantage is nobody can change it. You have to create your own options page to change whatever this value is going to be. And so, um, so if you want to add your own custom bindings by default, yes, it really is a missing piece. So, um, so yeah, we need, to, uh, we need to add that. And it looks like that may be it with regards to the um, the questions here. I think. Right? Yeah. So I will. Um, I think we will uh, with that let let it go and and uh, and folks who are watching this, yeah, if you, there's something you want to create, some easier way to move through code. You've got this awesome tap to next reference engine that does things like gives you this pink underline, does things like if I if I move somewhere else, I hit escape, I get back to the starting point again. Right, you have all of those things um, that are available to you, 
and uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's just like extending a refactoring. So, so in a refactoring, you get the menu, you get the ability to hook into code previews, and all of these things that you don't have to to build the infrastructure around because we've done it for you. Here, you get the tab to nets reference facilities of the underscores, the moving between the items. All you've got to do is provide us with a mechanism of finding all those items. Yeah. And it's it's beautiful in, in my opinion. I, I tell me oh, yeah. reference UI. I I really love this UI. It's like absolutely one of my favorites. It's the first thing that I think of as as wrong when I try and test something without Code Rush. I think where they've gone. I actually have several times got through nearly all the way filing a bug report saying this hasn't worked, and then I realized I turned it off. <laughs> this is crazy. Right. So Amanda, you want to uh, get us out of here? Yes, I totally will. All right, so um, thanks, Mark and Rory. Uh, we have a whole line of webinars that are currently posted through the end of July. You can check them out and register at devexpress.com slash webinars. Uh, coming up this week, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, what's new in WinForms Rich Edit in 11.1 uh, .1 with Rachel Reese. And then tomorrow at noon, Mark and Rory are back with another Code Rush feature workshop. Do you guys know what you're working on yet, or? Yeah, it's going to be part two from last from last time. So last time we um, we created a uh, a code issue, uh, as I recall, and it was um, I, I almost think it was on a Tuesday we did. It was or it was we were talking about code issues, and we were talking about some features we wanted to add to it. I need to refresh my memory on that, but what one of the things we're talking about is creating a code issue. When a um, when right, I think what, what we did, Mark, it, it was I disposable, and we did the making right. the I disposable. We didn't have a code issue to oh, that's prompt. Right. You. Yeah. Yes, we were going to create a code issue that that prompted you when you had something that implemented I disposable, and it had fields that were not disposed of inside its I disposable piece. So, yeah. and then the other thing we wanted to do was go in and create a new code provider that if we were to add a new field that it could then fix that by finding the right spot inside of the dispose method, the virtual one, and insert the code to dispose of that new field variable. It's it's yeah. really cool and advanced. By the time we it's good stuff. by the time it's working, it's going to be so sweet and easy to now all of a sudden implement I disposable. I think people will like that. So that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Awesome. And that's at noon tomorrow. And then Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, the fifth installment in our seven-part series on Windows Phone 7 with Chris G. Williams is building a pathfinding system using waypoints with XNA on Windows Phone 7. And this webinar will build on the previous webinar, so the fourth webinar. Um, if you want to watch that, you can watch it at tv.devexpress.com. And then finally, Friday, towards code correctness, integrating software contracts and unit testing with Dino Esposito of iDesign. This webinar shows you why you should look seriously at software contracts, code contracts, and the .NET jargon, and what's the appropriate angle and perspective for that. So again, if you missed anything from this webinar or you want to review any previous webinars or check out hundreds of our online product tutorials, you can do so on the DevExpress channel at tv.devexpress.com. Again, thanks to Mark and Rory. Thank you all for joining us, and thanks for choosing DevExpress. <laughs>